another episode and welcome to another episode of Ryan Eagles World. So let's get started with the prayer. I have a Catholic book of prayers that I bought, I want to say, probably a good five, six years ago. So haven't used it a lot. So definitely want to use it here and utilize it because it is what keeps the blood flowing. So uh, daily prayers, since it's about 8 o'clock in the morning right now, on what is it, uh, Tuesday, second day of the week. So morning prayers, offering to the Holy Trinity. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Most holy and adorable Trinity, one God in three persons. I praise you and give you thanks for all the favors you have bestowed upon me. Your goodness has preserved me until now. I offer you my whole being and in particular all my thoughts, words, and deeds. Together with all the trials I may undergo this day. Give them your blessing. May your divine love animate them and may they serve your greater glory. I make this offering, this morning offering in union with the divine intentions of Jesus Christ who offers himself daily in the holy sacrifice of the Mass and in union with Mary, his virgin mother, and our mother, who, has always, who was always the faithful handmaid of the Lord. Glory, to be, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Son, Holy Spirit. And there is for divine guidance through the day, a morning offering, another morning offering, prayer for God's protection in Christ's presence. Man, that's a lot. We'll continue reading those throughout the day. So, good morning. And if you haven't been to my show or this is the first episode you've seen, welcome. Uh, if this is multiple episodes you've uh, seen, well, thank you very much for your support. And let's get going. So, I have this book. I want to continue the seven values uh, to live by. We talked about courage and integrity. Those are the first two we talked about. Now we're going to talk about Enthusiasm, enthusiasm, number three. So I bookmarked it. Oh, you know what? I didn't even finish number two, which was courage, because it's a couple pages long, so I just will write a page or so. So let's continue with courage. Uh, let's see here. In order to receive a sponsorship for this position. Oh, man, it's a continuation of the story. From the other day that I read. Man. So let's read this all together. So it'll be all one flow. One piece flow. Living right requires courage. We need courage to get us through a disaster. We need to call upon courage to keep us going when the going gets tough. We need courage to face the unknown. Fortunately, we have constant access to a never-ending source of courage. We receive courage from God because it is of the Spirit. Courage is the sense of God's presence when we hear him say, I am with you always. Here are the three things you can do to develop courage. First, think courage. There is a theory called the law of attraction, which is the belief that like energy attracts like energy. If you practice thoughts of courage, courage will flow to you. If your thoughts of courage are deep and strong, the courage you feel will be deep and strong. That's... Uh, sports 101 if you practice practice makes perfect i mean it's this is simple we don't think about it in our prayer life though um or even courage so yeah the more you do it the more will come absolutely second act courageously we usually receive according to the way we act act courageously and courage will follow and third pray for courage god will give it to you because he will give you himself. Let me tell you about a woman whose great courage amazed me and also inspired many books. So before I go, let's just summarize of that. So think courage, act courage, and pray for courage. To me, that sounds like a good recipe. All right, so as well as the Ingrid Bergman movie. Oh, the Ingrid Bergman movie sounds familiar. The end of the sixth happiness Gladys Ali word was a petite British woman. Hardly an imposing figure. When she was seated, her feet barely touched the floor. When she had pure and undoubting faith, but she had pure and undoubting faith in God that gave her courage to accomplish great things. I was honored to meet her. 
And one day in my office, she told me her amazing story. She displayed employed, she's, she'd been employed as a housemaid, but she told me she felt God calling her to go overseas to China and become a Christian missionary. Interesting. As I continue, cheers, good morning everyone. Ah, good coffee. In order to receive a sponsorship for this position, she was required to pass a difficult test administered by a highly educated, highly intellectual committee. After reviewing her exam, the board announced that she hadn't passed and would not receive the sponsorship. Man, she hadn't mastered the Chinese language satisfactorily. But did that phase her? Not at all. She knew she had received her commission from a higher source than a mission board. Interesting. So obedient to God, Gladys Alleyward used her life savings and traveled to China. She spent her time on the streets in Yangchen and other cities, preaching to the people. This diminutive British woman told the people that no power on earth could overcome the one gave his, who gave his or her life to God and Jesus Christ. That person would become a resurrected soul and could triumph over the world. She went on delivering this message week after week. She was able to share God's goodness with the people who did not initially welcome her, but she became well known and trusted by the citizens and the city officials. One day, the governor pleaded for assistance in a horrific prison uprising. Murderers and other violent criminals residing there had started a riot. <laughs> Sounds familiar. One of the most dangerous men in the prison had a huge meat cleaver and had already killed two men and was threatening many others. Dang. If we go in, we will be liked, we'll be killed. The governor told her, we want you to go in and take the meat cleaver out of his hands. Wow. You must be out of your mind, sir, she replied. But the government, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you don't want to do it? You give a, a petite woman the job to do that? Crazy. But the government had heard her preaching in the streets, which is why he turned to her for help. I've listened to you saying that God is always with you and about Daniel in the lion's den and how Jesus Christ in your heart will protect you, he said. I've heard you and I believed you. Haven't you been telling the truth? Gladys Alleyward knew that if she ever wanted people to believe, then she would have to go into that prison. She asked the Lord to go with her and she felt strangely peaceful. The guards... Unlocked. I love how it says strangely because, yes, yeah, we're human at the end of the day. But she has courage. The guards unlocked the prison door and shut her in. There, at the end of the long, narrow tunnel, she saw men wildly running about, shouting and cursing. She prayed, Be with me, Lord. She walked to the end of the tunnel and saw the man with the meat cleaver, which was dripping with blood. Wow. Chasing another man, suddenly he was in front of her. They stood facing each other, the little woman and the giant. She looked into his wild and feverish eyes and calmly said, Give me that weapon. <laughs> there was a moment of hesitation then, with utter submissiveness, he handed to her. Now she said, Get in line, all of you. Quietly, they lined up. What are your complaints? she asked. I will tell them to the governor, and I assure you in that his name that where possible they will be corrected. As a believer, Gladys Alleyward found astonishing courage. Her secret can be found in a scripture verse from the Psalms that gives a formula anyone can follow to find courage in any situation. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Man. Then it says action steps. Always stick to your values and may require guts to stand by them, but it will be worthwhile. Pray specifically for courage. Become spiritually committed. Courage comes naturally from spiritual commitment. Deepen your commitment to Jesus Christ. He is the one who will give you courage. Well, number three, it says, become spiritually committed. Courage comes naturally from spiritual commitment. That is, uh, first of all, we have to pay for it, pray for it. And that's really what it does. We, we forget how to pray, and it's simple. Like, it's is literally closing your eyes or even silence. That's the amazing thing. You know, that that's just being silent can be a form of prayer. Just less, let, listen and let God come into your heart. So it's pretty, pretty astonishing, pretty amazing that story happened. I'll definitely look her up and 
what was it, Gladys Alleyward, and British lady went to China. It's unbelievable. So, uh, man, this batch of coffee is a lot better. I think I put my foot into that one. I'm going to have to make it the same <laughs> going forward. But, yeah, so courage is is just an amazing thing to to have. And we know we have it. We just pray for it. We have to pray for it. It's, it's almost an endless, it is an endless supply, but it's almost like a uh, gas pump. You know, we go to gas stations to get our gas, but it's there. Pretend the gas station is like hooked up to the side of us. We just have to pray for it to open up and to give to us. So uh, that's amazing there. Let's go to EWTN News. So today, August 4th, 2020, ahead of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing anniversary, the U.S. Catholic um, bishops prays for peace. All right. Let's read this one. So just days ahead of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. Now that you see more of these riots, people going crazy, it makes you think just a little bit what would have been like in the world in the World War Two era, where it's just literally we're fighting other people. It's crazy. Or even the Civil War you know, that happened with us, specifically in the U.S. So... It's crazy to think that in 75 years, we think it's long, but that's not even a hundred years. That's not even a century. So, and, you know, even with Jesus Christ's story coming to earth, it's 2,000 years ago. And that's not even the beginning. There's 2,000 years before that. It's unbelievable how, you know, we had to pray for peace right now because any moment a war can come out. You know, especially if there's a profit motive, who knows? You know, maybe it's good for people, good for businesses. And that's wrong. War is never good. <laughs> it's simple as that. So it's crazy. So, and, you know, they mourned the loss of innocent lives in the attacks, lamented the long term suffering caused by the bombs, and prayed for peace among nations. So if you think about it, and I never thought about this because you always. On the U.S. side, imagine those people getting bombed. Imagine you and I just sitting at home one day and it's, you know, you see outside like, what is this little meteor thing looking, coming closer and closer to us? And boom, it arrived, the bomb, and we're gone. You know, you never think about those things. So it's pretty sad what happened. You know, it's... We say it's necessary, and unfortunately, you know, at some point it is, but still, it is wrong. Man killing man is wrong. So it's it's a tough world out there. So we we you know, I don't know the answer. From you know, I always thought about what if I were to kill someone, but killing someone by defending my family, I. You know, how does that work in God's eyes? I don't know. You know. We can go to confession. He can heal us. But, you know, what happens when we pass away? So it's a beautiful mystery that we always will ask ourselves. And it's to me, it's fun because you just don't know. You're enjoying the ride and believing God and following His commandments. is pretty fun because you know what's going to happen if you do. You know, paradise. We think of paradise here. Multiply that by, I don't know. I just put a small number, a million. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. So um, the Hiroshima attack killed around, ooh, uh, so it was in 1945, August 6, 19. So that was, yeah, it's in two days from now for the anniversary. So Hiroshima attack killed around 80,000 people instantly and may have caused about 130,000 deaths mostly civilians the attack in Nagasaki instantly killed about 40,000 wow and destroyed a third of the city Damn. that's crazy Pope Francis had uh, has spoken out against the use of nuclear weapons multiple times including during a November 19th visit to Nagasaki and Hiroshima how can we propose 
peace if we constantly invoke the threat of nuclear war as a legitimate recourse for the resolution of conflicts. I mean, basically the U.S. did it once and we're like, okay, this has a lot of damaging effects. And just imagine if they did it to us. I mean, it's just any any threat, you know, any um, enemy. It's just crazy. So, no, I'm all against it. Uh, so, since St. John Paul II's visit to Japan in 1981, the Catholic Church in Japan has annually observed 10 days of prayer for peace beginning August 6th. And again, Catholicism is universal. People think, oh, it's it's not in Japan. It's in Japan, it's in China, it's the world. Even though they don't accept us, and they t tor literally, um, not torture us, but oh, yeah. I mean, they, they have killed... Many Catholic priests, many Catholic people, they have to go underground to have a mass. So it's, it's pretty crazy how it happens in China right now that they don't talk about. The next one is Obama alum running for Congress denies defrauding progressive Catholic group. Sure. <laughs> this will be fun. So by J.D. Flynn and Kevin Jones from Catholic News Agency in Denver. A former board of a progressive Catholic, progressive. So in other words, for progressive is changing the law and changing the rules of the Catholic Church. That's what I get out of it. So if a progressive Catholic political advocacy organization said Monday, the group's former executive director who is now vying for a congressional seat in Tennessee, defrauded the organization and eventually left it bankrupt. And he still wants to run. Man, that's crazy. I'm speaking publicly, publicly now, he said, with very little interest in scoring points. I'm simply here to speak on the record, to establish a fact pattern, to help explain to the public the disappointing experience I've had with Chris Hale, said James Salt, a former board member of Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good, in a live stream announcement August 3rd. Hale told CNA... Monday night that the idea that I drove the organization to bankruptcy or defraud it just fundamentally not true I kept the organization going sure you did hell is running in the Democratic primary in Tennessee or Tennessee's fourth congressional district his opponents in that race Noel Bivens hosted a live stream event with Saul on Monday evening after local media reported that hell is accused of misusing email lists from his former employee to fundraise for his own benefit. Salt said the political advocacy group, which aimed to advance Democratic candidates and policy initiatives by appealing to Catholics, was financially and legally harmed by Hale's leadership of the organization. My job is simply to be on the record saying he did a great disservice to everyone who has worked with them. After Hale was hired as executive director of Catholics in Alliance for the Common Good in 2013, Salt said he, we began to see a pattern, Chris, um, of obfuscating, obfuscating and avoiding any kind of accountability. Of course, I see this on LinkedIn all the time. Many connections I have, they're board members of like two, three, or even four more um, member or boards. How can you do that? How can you be effective? It's, it's just it's like Jobs 101, where you work at one job and you say, okay, I got to go to another one. We barely can do two jobs. And they, a board member is should be set to a higher standard, and they're on multiple boards, and they don't even do And then on top of that, I'm sure they have their own full-time job just because they have this title. So, And I've seen it myself when I was with Edward Jones that it was – you know, I, I won't say the, the um, charity, but I want to be part of a committee. And it was pretty easy to get on because I had the title. Oh, I was a financial advisor. Oh, I you know, dress nice. It has nothing to do with it. Yes, I dress nice because I want to feel nice. But how does that transform into how I can help? Nothing. It's just it's separate. It's just me feeling good. So it is... It's crazy how so many board members and so many committees and organizations, advocacy groups, all these things, they mean nothing. They just are a title that you can put on so you can run for something and you can be controlled by the higher beings of what, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. 
And unfortunately, I see it more in the Democratic Party. It happens in, in both parties, but I see it more vindictively in the Democratic Party. And it's just unfortunate. So it's, I believe that. And it says, in alliance, Catholics in alliance for the common good. A.K.A. you're switching the rules of the Catholic Church. What was his name? Tim Kaine or the running mate or the, yeah, the running mate, the vice president candidate. Uh, with Hillary Clinton in 2016. I forgot his name. Tim Kaine? Something Kane. But I remember when he talked about how to a group of thousands of people. He, or it might even be less, but a lot of people. And it was um, on CNN. Of course, they talk about it because it's totally different from the true Catholic Church. But he mentioned that Catholics were, were on the verge. The Catholic Church are on the verge. I mean, it's not going to happen, but it could happen, yeah. I could fly with with no plane tomorrow. I could jump from here all the way to Ohio with no shoes on. We could do anything. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's going to happen. But he's the way he worded it, he was like, the Catholic Church, I feel it. And there's a, it's on YouTube, definitely look it up, but he, he put it like as in his own point of view. Remember, when you put in your own point of view, you're making your own religion. It has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. When you're switching it, you're, ba you're essentially saying, I don't want to be a part of this, but I like the name, so I'm piggybacking on the name, and I'll make my own. And that's what he did. He mentioned about homosexuality and same-sex marriage. How, yes, I see it changing very soon, he said, in the Catholic Church. We see it. It's going to happen. And everyone gets excited. And how does that change throughout the course of time? People are going to say, well, yeah, I can see it happen. And then they'll tell another person, yeah, it's going to happen. And you tell another person. By the time you tell the 50th person, it will switch from it could happen to, oh, yeah, they're going to change. And boom, they automatically think that's how you change uh, events through the word of mouth and it is very dangerous and the Catholic Church till this day and will forever and not because it's a bad trend or all oh, will mean people it's just what God wants you can't change it there's so many sects or divisions of Christianity that have changed it and I'm telling you in two three hundred years from now we're not even going to be here they're going to lament it they're going to be sorry for it they're going to feel very, very sorry for it because it will go against God. It's as simple as that. Now, is there anything bad for them to do it? No, they're just any other sinners like us. But they will feel you know, uh, just lamented. You know, It's unfortunate, but yeah, that, that's what's going to happen. And the Catholic Church will continue because we, haven't, we won't be changing nothing. So that's crazy. Uh, and I hope... I hope he loses in Tennessee. I really do. So, and then one more. Citing impact of COVID, Cam, Camden Diocese suspends participa participation in abuse victim fund. Interesting. Let's read this one. The In New Jersey, the Diocese of Camden, New Jersey, said July 31st, it will suspend its participation in an independent compensation program for minor victims of clerical abuse, citing a precipitous decline in revenue resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. It's fast approaching a point where it will not be able to continue to borrow the funds necessary to pay the amounts awarded by the program. The diocese said, the five dioceses in New Jersey announced in February 19 the creation of the Independent Victim Compensation Program for victims of sexual abuse as minors by clerics, and clerics in the state. The Camden Diocese began its participation in the program during June 2019. Although awards to victims already made by the program's administrators will be paid, the diocese is instituting a moratorium on further determinations or awards, it says. So from my point of view, even the beginning, I don't think they should be paid at all. Why? Just think about it. So when... That bad act happens, and remember, there's been about what little over a hundred cases out of 36,000 priests in the U.S. So it's less than a third of a percent, if I remember correctly, the uh, division on that. But those people 
in my opinion, should be in jail for life. We can't take another life. So I wish I can do that. But agony. <laughs> the the grindy of teeth, but Earth's version, not Hell's version. It's almost the same, but Hell's version is a lot worse. And we can't do it because we're not... Or no, we're not in internal hell yet. But it's, I feel that hell on earth should be granted to that person. It just does. Um, you know, if he gets abused, if he gets you know, um, tortured, not dead, but tortured. I mean, whatever it may be, I'm sorry, but that, he should, he should suffer for that. But... God will will take care of it, and that's the thing. My brother and I, my brother-in-law and I, talked about this back. Whew, we're in 2020 now, and that was what 2013, 2014, around that time before I got married. And we talked about you know if a guy were to um, abuse our children, and I didn't have any kids at the time, but he says if his a guy came in and abused his daughter, he would kill him. And I'm like, I, I get it, but I'm like, I cannot do it. I was forming my faith at the time. I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. Yes, I'll have this rage and everything, but we have to have that rage and turn it into good and pray that, first off, that he will not do it again. That's what we have to pray for. We have to pray that he can change his ways. And also, if you know, make that or pray for that young girl so she can... Forgive him. I mean, all these things are spiritual. It has nothing to do with the physical part. It's the spiritual part. And when he heard that, he was like, you're crazy. He's like, I'll kill him. Simple as that. I'm like, yeah, but what does it cause? Nothing. And when more and more people be like that. He has to change. And it's within. He has to have courage to stop whatever evil he has in his head. And come to God. But it's hard for society to get that, to grasp that. So that that's a sad part about it because we all think, oh, let's, let's kill this guy too. No. You know, yes, they're priests. Yes, they're on a higher standard. And yes, I believe that whatever evil comes to them, if they don't pray for their own conversion, they're always being hell. So we have to pray for them and pray for the other 30 six plus thousand priests and many other thousands around the world that they don't get caught up in that as well we have to continue praying because we physically can't force them we pray for them through the intercession of the saints of mary to have jesus christ come into their lives so it's it's pretty crazy how these things happen but yeah so going back to that and plus all those things i just mentioned it has nothing to do with money, so I didn't even I didn't even agree with them giving them money, anyways. What's what money is gonna do? I would call it tainted money, because you didn't do nothing to better that person. You don't you didn't pray for for that priest. You didn't pray for your kid that went through this horrible horrible act. You didn't do nothing of that. You just received the money. What's the money gonna do? I'm sorry, but money ain't going to do nothing. <laughs> it's just not. So, and plus with this whole pandemic going crazy, they have to look at their funds. And yeah, if they need to slash that off, fine. I know there's going to be a lot of angry people because money is their God. <laughs> but no. And there should be other ways. So the Catholic Church should, and again, the diocese should think of other ways to to take care of them. But unfortunately, all we care about is money. So money will at least uh, take care of things for now. Which I, which I disagree. So there should be other ways to do that. Give them, uh, hell, give them um, lessons. Give them free psychiatry lessons. Or um, what do you call it? Psychiatry visits. I mean, anything. You know, we can help them psychologically. That should be one way. All that for free. Um, you know, whatever. There should be creative ways. I haven't thought about it right off the back, but that's at least one. Um, have them go to any Catholic school in, in the world. 
You know, all these things has nothing to do with money. It's just something that we want you to become with God. That's why. And I said this many times before for people who get mad that Christians and even the more radical Christians, and I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about just the more in your face Christians that are still peaceful and nice, but they will be vocal about their faith. You know, you're a Jehovah's Witness, our separate brothers in Christ, we call them, because um, they believe totally different from the Catholic Church. Obviously, with Jesus, they, they mention that, and with Mary, um, so there's big differences, but it, we still believe in Jesus Christ. It's just a different form. And even with them, we, we pray, and, and it's just, you know, through those times, we just have to believe that God will be with us. You know, God will take care of us. And all those people who get mad, uh, but all oh, they're pushing their faith on us. No, they have something beautiful to share with you because they know that it brings peace. If you had something, if you had a, uh, a golden goose, you're not going to keep it for yourself. And if you do, you're selfish. <laughs> and again, that's against the Catholic Church, being selfish. We have to share the good news. Evangelio in Spanish, it means evangelical, but it means the gospel in Spanish. The translation of evangel Evangelio is um, the gospel. We share the good news. So that that's, that's the uh, beautiful thing about it. And it's sad that they deal with only money, but, you know, tough times. I'm sure they are cutting a lot of other things that affects thousands of other people. So... Um, it's unfortunate, but I, I'm not getting mad, and I'm not getting angry over that. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to the Apple News. So, CNN. Fun, fun, fun. CNN says COVID-19 is widespread in the U.S., but there are some states doing things right. <laughs> Yeah, your Idaho's, your North Dakota's, Montana. Oh my gosh, I don't even know if I should read that. Let's see how it goes. So USC leaders have struggled to enforce social gathering rules and mask mandates as residents push for a return to normal life. So you're saying all these, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not demands, but... Uh, oh my gosh, what's the word? Uh... Yeah, I guess the mandates. There you go. They have all these legal mandates. They pushed right away to pass these little mandate things that you have to wear these things. And they're saying they're they're struggling to enforce social gathering rules. Come on, give me a break. It's ridiculous. So, but while people may be tired of the pandemic, there's still a long way to go. One World Health official said Monday. So, I'm totally against these riots. And what a coincidence. Uh, Nick DiPaolo mentioned this as far as a timeline the other day where it is uh, where you have, uh, what was it, the coronavirus hit, you know, around April and then we had the lockdown for a couple weeks and then by the end of May, the riots or the, uh, for the George Floyd happened and there were protests and everything and what a coincidence, a couple of weeks later after that, it spiked. So it's... You know, we don't have proof, but we have common sense. So it's just, it's crazy how they say this. And they always talk about how, oh, it's, we give them pass for protesting. And again, no make, make no mistake about it. Right now in July, no, in August 4, 2020, these are riots that are happening. And when riots happen, injuries happen, deaths happen. So, and I saw a video where a guy was recording something. He says, oh, look, they're not doing nothing. The police just go crazy and try to snatch them and push them out of the way of the streets. No. They've been there for days, for weeks, and they tell them multiple times to leave. I don't know. I'm not a legal lawyer person, but that is against the law, I'm assuming. <laughs> and if you don't listen... They're going to pull and bring out the dogs, the big guns. And they don't even have guns. Or they have guns, but they're not even using guns. So not even the big guns. They're just taking their bikes and pushing people out. And even horses, too. I think in Austin they have it. And it's just ridiculous now. People want their 15 minutes of fame. I saw one video where a guy 
one person's recording and they're recording that a guy has a phone and he gives it to another person. He says, hey, can, can you take a picture? You can't hear it, but he's asking him. So he gave him the phone and he goes in front of the crowd where the line is at, basically, where it separates the rioters or the so-called so -called, uh, protesters and then the line of the police. And they take a quick snapshot. They're like, hey, this, the hands up or whatever. And he went back and grabbed his phone and he left. That was a video recording of it. And I'm like, wow, it's just people want the 15 minutes of fame and, and their coolness. And if you watch very closely any of these crazy um, street videos that you see on the streets with these riots, mostly everyone is recording. So it's just unbelievable. They don't care about it. So it, it's ridiculous, this, this whole pandemic. And... People are making money off of this. And I'm not talking about your John Doe in your grandma's basement. I'm talking about big companies, your Apples, your Amazon, your Facebook, everything. They're getting lost in ad sales because then people are not doing it over the internet. And they're still making money. It's unbelievable. It's just ridiculous. They, what a coincidence. Amazon record profits. Apple record um, quarterly profits. You're telling me that's a coincidence. So it's ridiculous. Um, Value Tainment, Patrick Bet David, he he um, put a post on LinkedIn about close to 150,000 um, restaurants have closed from the beginning when it started coronavirus to now. 150,000. Then some people wrote, well, I see so many restaurants around here. They're booming right now. Well, yeah, if you think about it, the supply and demand conversation is very simple. The supply went down because the demand went down, but it wasn't really a demand. It wasn't like we gave up on restaurants. We didn't like restaurants. No, it's we could not go to a restaurant. So in essence, it grew the demand even more because it's like you're being tied up and what happens when you get freed? You feel so excited. You're like, man, you know, if you don't, if you don't go um, to a restaurant for a long time and then when you're able to go or you want to go, you get so excited. It's the same thing. It just put a pause. That demand never went down. It was paused. But the supply went down and they won't be coming back. 150 plus thousand restaurants in the U.S. have closed for good. So you have this so-called low demand, but it's really just even higher demand going up little by little because people get so excited. And then when restaurants are open up, they're going to go crazy. Instead of spending some uh, amount of money, they're going to spend more than that, what they normally do. So they're going to go more and more into restaurants. So the demand's going higher and the supply went lower. It only makes sense that the restaurants that lasted are going to be filled with people. And they're not going to be your mom and pop shops. They're going to be your you know, chain stores, your five guys. Um, you know, So many other uh, restaurant chains that are going to stay there. And they're going to take the profits. And just, it's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. So please support the local restaurant because we don't know how long this is going to last. And I'm telling you, Rome did it almost 2,000 years ago. Um, you know, Hitler tried to do it, take over the world. There's, um, we always say, oh, he's an evil man. And yes, he's an evil man. But the thoughts of him were evil. And we have the same thoughts. And it can transform into different actions, but the same thought is there. How can I take over the world? You think Google hasn't thought about that? You think Facebook hasn't thought about that? How can I take over the world? But no, no let's let's um, wrap it up with a nice bow that's different from you know wars and everything. They're investing in what my, I may be off of Microsoft, but I know exactly for Google and Facebook. They're putting billions of dollars i'm talking about four maybe ten billion dollars into india's just i call it desert where there's no population and they're putting so much into that because they're saying quote unquote 
India has more people without internet than do that have internet. So we want to help them. We want to get them connected. All these nice little things. But what they're really doing is controlling the world. And they haven't got to India yet. Because they took care of everywhere else. Now they're going to these desert places. What is that called? That's called the modern day virtual invasion. And we're not doing it with no weapons. We're not doing it with no violence. We're doing it nice. <laughs> but it's the same concept. You're going to take over the world. You think you're going to share those profits with those people, share the profits with us? No. So it's very sick. It's very crazy. And it has nothing to do with capitalism. Capitalism, everyone should have a fair shake. Let us compete. But if you are taking, if you're basically controlling the game, that's not the definition of capitalism. There is no competition when you deal with Google. And yes, they may say, oh, there's Jeeves.com. There's Ask Jeeves. There's Yahoo Searched. No, it's Google. Oh, there's Chrome. <laughs> Google has actually started Chrome, if I remember correctly. Or that's Microsoft. But no, it's Google. Same thing with Amazon. Oh, there's so many other people. The Shopify, no, there's Amazon, but you can't say it because there's other, there's other, uh, and same thing with Uber, you know, there's other com competitors, but it's not many competitors, it's literally one other one, and just for the sake of having another competitor, but if you go apples, apples, they're nothing compared to those big ones, those big companies, so it's crazy, but, um, you know, it's going back to why this pandemic is happening, Maybe they want it because right now it is getting better. It's just you feel, no pun intended, you feel in the air. You feel that people are just getting back to work and some of them have to go back to work. And now it's just a regular flu. And that's the other thing I was talking to my wife about it. The one thing I couldn't think about more and more when someone says about abortion, they mention, well, do you, I tell them, like, do you know that they use these cells for vaccine research and they're like well uh, that's actually kind of good you can get I'm like no it's not so you're killing one person to make a vaccine so that means I can kill you if you have a great cells or quote unquote because we're business people we can make you be or we can convince you to make you feel like it's your choice you're helping the people yeah kill me <laughs> that's what it is that's really what it does and that could happen. And she said, uh, well, it's good. And it can cure cancer. She threw that in. And I just laughed. I'm like, give me a break. From a business perspective, uh, my point of view, they're never going to find cancer. Let me correct that. They have found cancer, but they will never give it to us, that cure. They will never. Because treating it, and it's an old saying. I'm not the first one saying saying this. Treating it makes a lot more money than curing it. And in a godly perspective, it's greed. We, it all comes down to greed and power. And for all these charities, especially Catholic charities, you know, it's unfortunate because in order for them to exist, they have to have that issue always. They never say, oh, we're going out of business. We want the Catholic charities to go out of business. We want all these crazy charities to go out of business. That means you did your job, but it will never. And it's very sad. Same thing with cancer. We want no cancer. We want no no doctors. <laughs> but it will always be because treating it makes a heck of a lot more money than that. Here in uh, in Texas where we live, it's down a couple miles from us. It's like a whole museum of hospitals, like good a mile almost, at least a half a mile. But like good four or five blocks of buildings. It's just unbelievable how many, how much money is in the medical industry. And we treat it like, oh, it's, it's a necessity. But if you were to find a cure, you never, half of those or even 95% of those buildings will be shut down. <laughs> it's only when you have an emergency. But yeah, a lot of it is just continued treatment. And it's sad that... They haven't found a re uh, 
can't, or they haven't dis, um, told people about a cure or have it um, in the main population or the mainstream population. So it's sad. And, and I, that's why I told the lady, I'm like, it's not, they're never going to find it. They're doing vaccines. What's vaccine? It's to help you not to spread it to others, but you will have it. It won't take care of the underlying um, disease. It just helps you to stop. It helps you preventing to um, transmitting it. So, and to us, that's what they're doing right now for coronavirus. We always think, oh, they're looking for COVID vaccines. If you use a vaccine, not cure, not cure, vaccine. So there'll still be deaths. The flu vaccine, there'll still be deaths. They haven't found a cure for, for the flu. Maybe they have, but again, they don't show it. And that's crazy. It's just unbelievable. So all those things about coronavirus and how it's affecting everyone, just live your life. Be respectful. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. But don't go crazy if they don't. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, we're humans communicating with humans. That's really what it is. And I think of Jesus going to the leper, the person that had leprosy. And he loved him. And he touched his face and everything. So just be like Jesus. You know, and, uh, if they have it, that's great. If people don't wear a mask, fine. But don't make a big argument. Fight. It's just they want more division. And who are they? I believe the Democratic Party because think about it. It only helps them more. They want to do mail-in voting, which you've seen on YouTube. Just type it in YouTube. There's so many people that are trying. In New Jersey, they did a, a sample of 100 votes that look exactly like them. And 10% of them um, were unfound. So 10% of what well, almost 200 million people are going to be voting. 10% of... A hundred million is a million, right? Maybe wrong. No, 10 million. Dang. So we're talking about 20 million. 20 million people I'll not vote, cannot vote. They could, but they will ne it will never be counted. And we'll never know because we think we're, our vote counts by putting in the mail. And who knows where it arrives. So and that's just a hundred people. 10% of a hundred people. Just imagine if... The whole country votes. <sighs> That'll be unbelievable how much more. I think it'll be a lot more. So, no, use our technology. What, we just throw away the technology? It's just dumb. I have more faith in technology on their app than on paper. At least on the app, there's only one set of companies that can do it compared to thousands of post office that have, or hundreds of post office around the country and thousands of employees are touching and seeing it. So no, uh, do technology. Mm, I would rather have an app and I'll trust that I'll, I'll uh, deal or I'll handle or negotiate that way. I'll bargain with you if we can't do it going to those, um, what do you call it, the computer part of it. But yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. And then also it helps the Democratic Party for Biden. Biden is should be in a nursing home. And I don't mean it as a joke. I mean it seriously. Like... But again, don't underestimate them. I what was it? Uh, I think Nick DePaula. I like to watch his video. Um, you know, Monday through Thursday. Look it up. He's a cool guy. Uh, I like him. He doesn't pay me at all, but I love talking about him because I love sharing good news. And he cusses a lot, but so don't watch it around your kids. But man, he is so just so articulate and just pretty smart. And he's just an average guy. That's what I like about it. He just, he connects to everyone. So I like him. But look him up. And of course he's informative. So that's the great thing. But he mentioned how, you know, they might be doing this on purpose. And they mentioned Kamala Harris might be the VP running mate for, with him. And just imagine that. If he were to win and they're going to say, oh, well, look at all the, now they're going to admit all these years of diminishing health, he has to go out, but has nothing to do with his record, how bad of a president is because we care about him, about his health. And they're twisted into something of a, a sad thing. Oh my gosh, Biden, hopefully he feels better. Oh my gosh, he's my president. He went through all this craziness and uh, he still won. And uh, 
Um, and then what happens? They get a black woman as president as because she's the VP and she automatically goes into um, presidency. So again, that is a possible option because they're not talking nothing about his diminished health. And Trump said and talks about one thing or walks one way or puts, I do it sometimes too because I don't want coffee on my tie. And he does this and they say, oh my gosh, he has dementia. He has all these problems. So give me a break, CNN and MSNBC and all of them. So it's ridiculous. So let's go to the saint of the day. Well, there's only one. I want to do at least one or two of the mainstream media. Uh, let's see here. All right. So we have Washington Post. Two black moms say they were confronted with guns by the Secret Service while parked. Remember, Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon. Just keep that in mind. And they are left wing. They just are. You can't dispute that. It was a lot. It was a hot Thursday afternoon, so India Johnson, 26, and Yasmin Winston decided to take their babies to splash in the fountains at the World War II Memorial. The women, best friends since seventh grade, parked on a Constitutional Avenue near the White House and prepared to walk to the mall. Their babies were in the back seat. Mother Goose Club was singing through the car speakers, and the mothers were digging. Man, they're telling us the story. Why don't they just give us the news? They're painting a story for us. I mean, I feel like I'm reading a book rather than reading a newspaper, a.k.a. news. <laughs> Keyword news. So not really paper, but we'll deal with that. So the, finally, after a couple of paragraphs later, uh, we're at, looked up. A Secret Service cruiser has driven into their front left bumper. Winston told the Washington Post within seconds, Winston recalled a uniformed Secret Service officer was pointing a rifle at them, yelling, get out and put your hands in the air. More officers surrounded them with guns pulled, and the woman said over the next hour, Winston Johnson said they were handcuffed without reason, separated from their crying babies and handled by police who at first, but we shouldn't get mad at your crying babies, only illegal immigrants babies, because that's our agenda. Now we're talking about your babies. What about... Um, Babies who have stripped from their families because their fathers are jerks and criminals and they don't care about their wives or not even their wives but uh, their partners or their kids or women. You think women are all perfect? There are women that abandon their kids. What about their babies? Oh, but crying babies here is good. It's crazy. Anyways. So over the next hour, Winston, I read that, uh, handled by police, didn't, who at first did not wear masks to protect against the novel coronavirus. The women are now demanding that the Secret Service investigate the encounter publicly released details of the incident that they said made them feel for their lives and safety. This incident took place near our national monuments across from the White House there. Timothy Maloney wrote in the letter demanding an investigation of Secret Service James Murray over the weekend. It occurred after eight weeks of unprecedented national demonstration. Buck says, oh, demonstration. Wow, liars. They don't talk about the riots. So initially the women said an officer told them the vehicle had been reported stolen and that the suspects were two black men. But the women, both African Americans, said no men were with them and provided proof that Johnson was the owner. She told the Secret Service she had never reported the car stolen. Eventually, the women were released without apology or answers to their questions. Days later, they said they still don't know why the Secret Service targeted them. I could have been another Brianna Taylor. Oh, my gosh. So, I don't even know the story of Brianna Taylor. So, I'm assuming it's another police brutality Um that what if it happens once a month that's 12 out of the year so if i think that's the last time i heard since george floyd that's a couple months ago so again it's ridiculous it's it's it has nothing to do with the overall systemic racism i don't believe in that i just don't it's classism classism and that's it i believe in classism and i believe that it exists and I hate it because 
any type of categorism is not good. But for race, again, there are people getting stopped of all races, me including. <laughs> and you just take your licks, and I don't mean physically, take the licks as in your punishment. And what is your punishment? Your legal punishment, your tickets. If you don't have no physical altercation with them, what are they going to do? Give you a ticket. And if you did not pay your tickets or if you are running from the law, which is mostly the uh, the most popular one that you have, a.k.a. have a warrant out, you know in your head what you've done. You don't have Alzheimer's yet. We will soon. But you you know what you've done. So you kind of hide. You become more of a jerk. Oh, I don't have to tell you nothing. I don't answer questions. Why not? If you have anything, if you have something to hide, then you won't talk. So it's it's ridiculous. Take your licks, meaning pay your your tickets. If you got to go to jail because you did something wrong, pay your licks by doing that. It's just the way of the law. You broke it, you buy it. <laughs> Simple as that. You know, if you if you do the crime, you got to do the time. I mean, it's just it's just ethics one on one. But we don't do it. We don't admit that we're wrong. We don't. So we push on others. So when they say, oh, I have no idea. Listen, technology. They could talk about secret service. Oh, we made a mistake. Technology rarely makes mistakes. Especially if you do it correctly. You can talk to any software guy about that. Anywhere. Look how Amazon controls almost all the country. Yeah, there may... And same thing with Google. Yeah, they may have some mistakes, but 99% they're right. <laughs> they always have this little glitch, but 99% they're right. Same thing with these computer systems. If your car was reported stolen, did you see, allegedly, she said she never reported it stolen. Something happened. Again, they would never tell us the whole story. Something happened. Secret Service is getting paid a lot of money. And they don't get paid for making mistakes. I believe more of these newspapers that show their true colors painting a different picture compared to Secret Service making a mistake. I believe more that they are pushing an agenda themselves and maybe lying themselves. Could be, could not. But I believe that more than the Secret Service making a mistake. It just does. So, but we, you could take it however you want it but i'll tell you my take on it so that is the story about that and they have so much more oh my gosh i'm not gonna read it because it's probably the same thing demonstrators instead of rioters demonstrate what do you demonstrate violence <laughs> it's crazy but anyway so those are a couple stories there for the day uh, and then saint of the day i wrote that here I was reading part of it, but not all of it. So, Saint of the Day is Saint John Vianney. I think there's a church around here, too. I think, but, um, yeah. John Baptista Marie Vianney, excuse me, known as John in English, was born May 8th, 1786. So, 1719. 18, 19, 20, so three years, almost 300 years ago, less than 300 years, in, in France, Dardilly, France, and was baptized the same day. He was the fourth of six children born to Matthew and Marie Vianney. John was raised in a Catholic home, and the family often helped the poor in house St. Benedict Joseph Library when he made his pilgrimage to Rome. In 1790, so he's four years old, when the and and clery, clerical terror phase of the French Revolution forced priests to work in secrecy or face execution. I say that again. So now I know. 1790, so 1800, close to 1800. It's the anti-clerical terror phase of the French Revolution. If you want to talk about the French Revolution, what's going on here? He said, oh, it's the French Revolution. And his forced priests to work in secrecy or face execution. Young Vianney believed the priests were heroes. He continued to believe the, in the bravery of the priests and received his first communion catechism instructions in private by two nuns who lost their convents to the revolution. Wow. 
At 13 years old, John made his first communion and prepared for his confirmation secrecy. When he was 20 years old, and that's 13, so he was four, so more than 10 years ago. So 10 years they've been doing that. I mean, killing. If you believe in God, if you continue being a priest, we'll kill you. You don't hear about that in your books. No, no, no. And again, it's just common sense. I'm learning about this. So I'm being educated on my own, too. I don't have to go to a college to learn, even though I have a college degree. But for some reason, we think we have to go to school to learn. <laughs> you can learn in your home. You can learn by opening your eyes and reading a book and turning the pages. And they're free if you didn't know that. There's a thing that's called a, what is it called? Oh, yeah, a library. There's this building. It's a public building, too, and paid by tax money, if I remember correctly. So you may not like that because it's part of the government. But they have books, and you can choose. You can choose yourself. So you can be biased, or you can learn on your own. You're not being pushed a certain way like schools do now. So it's crazy how these things happen. So 1,800 for 10 years. It's unbelievable. Man. And again, I'm just learning about these things. But I always had that idea that it's a trend that so many people are just going away from the church. I'm telling you, I'll say this over and over again. It's not about Democrats, Republicans. It's about religion versus no religion. That's what it is. It's a constant battle throughout these centuries. And we just tie it up with a different bow. That's what it is. But same thing. So when he was 20 years old, John was allowed to leave the family farm to learn at a pres presbytery school in Eculi. There he learned math, history, geography, and Latin. As his education had been disrupted by the French Revolution, he struggled in his studies, particularly with Latin, but worked hard to learn. In 1802, the Catholic Church was reestablished in France and religious freedom and peace spread throughout the country. See, isn't that beautiful? It takes 10 years of that. And we haven't even scratched the surface of a, of a week because people don't, I don't know, they're burning Catholic statues. They talk about the government statue, but they're, they're going for the Catholic statues too. And in Florida, you know, people are trying to um, burn down churches. You see what happened in Notre Dame, Notre Dame. They burned down the church. And I don't know if it's completely and tore down, but they set fire on it. Set fire, a guy ran in, in a Florida Catholic church in the morning. Um, what was it, probably a month or so ago? You probably never heard of that. Look that up. Guy drove into a little chapel inside the Catholic church in, in Florida with his van. I mean, these things are happening right now. And it's, it's sick. It's not just the Catholic church, but Jewish mosques as well. It's just unbelievable. And they say white, black. No, it's... Religion versus no religion. That's really what it is. So it took 10 years for it to reestablish peace. Believe me, the French Revolution wasn't no peaceful revolution. <laughs> they revolted. They went against it. So it's crazy. And ultimately, they spread peace throughout the country, it says. So unfortunately, uh -oh, unfortunately, in 1809, John was drafted into Napoleon's Bonaparte's armies. Wow, Napoleon was part of that. He had been studying as a ecclesiastical student, which was a protected title and would normally have accepted him for military services, but Napoleon had withdrawn the exception in some dioceses as he required more soldiers. Two days into his service, John fell ill and required hospital hospitalization. As his troop continued, he stopped in a, at a church where he prayed. Then he met a young man who volunteered to return him to his group, but instead led him deep into the mountains where military deserters met. John lived with them for one year and two months. He used the name Jerome Vincent and opened a school for the nearby village of Los no Noah's children. John remained in Los Noah's and hid when Gedemanis Gender, gender mists came in search of deserters until 1810. When deserters were granted amnesty, now free, John returned to Eccli and resumed his ecclesiastical studies. He attended a minor seminary, Abbey Bailey, in 1812, is eventually ordained a deacon in June 
1815. He joined his heroes as a priest August 12th, 1815 in the, in the Coven de Minimis de Grenoble. His first mass was celebrated the next day and he was appointed assistant to the belly in Ecui. Three years later, when Bailey passed away, oh, Father John Vianney was appointed pr parish priest of the Ars Bishop. Um, with help from Catherine Lazan and Benedicta Lera, La Providencia Home for Girls was established in Ars. When he began his priestly duties, Father Vianney realized many were either ignorant or indifferent to religion as a result of the French Re Revolution. Many danced and drank on Sundays or worked in their fields. Father Vianney spent much time in confession and often delivered home homilies against blasphemy and dancing. Finally, if parishioners did not give up dancing, he refused them absolution. He spent 11 to 12 hours each day working to reconcile people with God. In the summer months, he often worked 16 hours a day and refused to retire. His fame spread until people began to travel to him in 1827. Within 30 years, it is said he received up to 20,000 programs each year. Man. He was deeply devoted to St. Philomena and erected a chapel and shrine in her honor. When he later became deathly ill but miraculously recovered, he attributed his death to St. Philomena's intercession. In 1853, Father Vianney had attempted to run away from ours four times, each attempt with the intention of becoming a monk, but decided after the final time that it was not to be. Six years later, he passed away and left uh, behind a legacy of faith and was viewed as a champion of the poor. On October 3, 1873, Pope Pius IX proclaimed um, Father Vianney as venerable, and on 18, uh, January 8, 1905, Pope Pius X beatified him. St. John Vianney was canonized on May 31st, 1925. His feast days was declared August 9th, but it was changed twice before it fell to August 4th. St. John Vianney would often say, Private prayer is like a straw scattered here and there. If you set it on fire, it makes a lot of flames, but... Gather these straws into a bundle and light them, and you get a mighty fire rising like a column into the sky. Public prayer is like that. Wow. So public prayer. That's a beautiful thing. I love you, oh my God. There's a prayer to St. John Vianney. Beautiful. I love you, oh my God, and my only desire is to love you until the last breath of my life. I love you, oh my, oh my, infinite, infinitely lovable God, and I would rather die loving you than live without loving you. I love you, Lord, and the only grace I ask is to love you eternally. My God, if my tongue cannot say in every moment that I love you, I want my heart to repeat it to you as often as I draw breath. Man. Amen. We don't talk about that in the Catholic Church, or in the Catholic, about the Catholic Church in these mainstream medias. Maybe not even the Catholic Church. Obviously, he's a saint, so we recognize him, but man, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and then let's go to, there's some other things I want to talk about, but we're a good hour in. So um, there's a stock info that I want to do. So right now, the NASDAQ is up 35 points, which is a third of a percent at 10937 the New York Stock Exchange is not even up um, half a percent, is 12,543. Dow Jones is barely 1% up, 26,689. So that's pretty good. Um, and then the Catholic Answers, I saw this one time and I wanted to see, they basically have any answer you could think of. Go on Catholic, was it Catholic.com, I guess? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess it's Catholic.com, but is Get Catholic answers, basically. And it says, no, truth is not like a lion. But hold on. Um, there are cool answers that they had. I guess I'll look this up. A, uh, I'll miss you. Yeah, about Catholic answers. I'll look that up before, but it's kind of cool. Uh, I wrote, what was it? I typed in saint of the day, and then it popped up, and that's how I found it. What's the point 
of All Saints Day. So, yeah, what was what's the point of All Saints Day? And October 31st, 2018, Jimmy Aiken answered, or asked. So every December, the secular culture celebration of Christmas overshadows the religious holiday on which it is based. Essentially, the same thing happens at the end of October when the way American culture celebrates Halloween overshadows All Saints Day. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with the costumes and candy, but in the minds of most people, Halloween has become so detached from its religious roots that they have no idea where it comes from. See, it's okay to wear costumes, but when you are, you know, revering that more than the meaning of Halloween or the um, All Saints Day is, is different. That's why I let my, or our kid, our son, wears either he was Jesus or St. Francis, something that you can celebrate in a very positive way instead of a gross and gruesome way like what Halloween is right now and then the movies yeah the old-fashioned word Halloween contributes to this people may have an inkling that is short for all Hallows Eve but that doesn't help much because they don't know what a hollow is or what it means to celebrate the eve of something English has an unusual double vocabulary with, with many words based on Latin roots, but others based on German roots. That's why we have two words for so many things. One example is cat, derived from German root and feline, derived from a Latin root. The word hollow belongs to one of the German Latin pairs, and, but it's much less familiar to us than the parallel word from the Latin saint. So hollow comes from the word, the same root as holy, Interesting. As a person who, well, that makes sense. Holy, hollow, it's kind of close. And a person who is hollowed is a saint. Interesting. Someone who has been sanctified or made holy. Thus, in the Lord's Prayer, we say, hallowed be thy name. Interesting. Wow. Hallowed be thy name. Wow. If we say that in using words derived from Latin, it will be something like, let your name be sanctified. May people treat God's name as something holy and thus honor the holiness of God himself. The E-E-N part of Halloween is similarly old-fashioned. E, comma, or, uh, yeah, comma, E-N is a contradiction of the word even. An older way of saying evening. Halloween is thus All Hallows' E-N, or the evening of all saints, and it came to be celebrated as an early anticipation of the day that followed. The same way people celebrated Christmas Eve in the same uh, in anticipation of Christmas Day. Wow. But why celebrate All Saints Day in the first place, is asked. Some of our Protestant friends object to the Catholic custom of celebrating certain saints and giving them special attention. Aware that there are liturgical days commemorating individual saints, they want to know why there aren't celebrations for all the other people in heaven. So after all, in Revelation, John describes the population of heaven this way. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude which no man could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. Don't all all the all those other people deserve recognition too? So the answer is that they do. And that is why we have All Saints Day. Since there are only 365 days in the year, not every person in heaven can have his own liturgical commemoration. But they are all should be recognized for the way they cooperated with God, God's grace. Thus, All Saints Day was created to commemorate every last individual in heaven, even those salvations known to God alone. So if your departed grandmother is in heaven, even though she's never been canonized, on All Saints Day, in the the Catholic Church commemorates her and the work God did in her life. She too has a place in the liturgical calendar alongside the more famous saints. Boom. So I can celebrate and commemorate my mom on All Saints Day. She's not a saint, but I know I like to say she's in heaven, and we believe in that. That is something new. So precisely when they that day occurs will depend which liturgical calendar you're using. I'll let you... They have different calendars, but 
Man, that is pretty interesting. So, hollow be the name is holy. It has nothing to do with gruesome and grossness and terror and blood and gore. Nothing of that. Scary nothing. They probably mm, der derived that from, oh, you know, they're, they're dead, but they're holy. They passed on. But they might think, oh, they're dead, they're coming alive, all this stuff. And it probably started as a joke a long time ago. Who knows? But now it's turned into a... Uh, a crazy scare fest and it's not good at all and a lot of times they the media and the movie world the Hollywood world they make some bad crazy movies so it's, it's unbelievable so um, that's a cool thing why do saints exist um, so business info I want to talk about so the top stories again I got this from Apple business news I guess but the Wall Street Journal stock edge lower as earnings season Marches on. Uh, Market Watch BP rallies after cutting dividend while Diego Diego slumps after says maintaining something. Then Microsoft's rescue attempt of TikTok endures old company to new generation. Um, the pandemic workday is 48 minutes longer and has more meetings. Well, duh. That's why you think it's good to have an email before the coronavirus. You just work more. So now you have everything at home, you're going to work more. So that's why it's crazy. A record high for the NASDAQ, and this is Market Watch. Record high for the NASDAQ would all come crashing down, says Trump in a tweet, including your job stocks if Biden wins presidency. That is true. That is true. Because, I mean, I wouldn't say it's going to go in mayhem, but more the reaction to it not just because he's president but everything else that will follow he'll let these crazy democratic cities go about he will let more rioters he'll let more revolt and what does that do it kills more restaurants it kills more businesses because everything apparently is systematically racist so they have to tear down and shut down everything that comes with the price so yeah you're gonna have companies going down i wouldn't say the 401ks because Again, it's connected to the stock market, and the stock market will be fine. Believe me, it will go up and down, but people are making money like that. So uh, it's unfortunate. So reading of the day, the gospel of the day. So let's look that one up here real quick. Uh, let me see here. Uh, audio prayers, basic prayers. Daily readings right here. Nice. I'm looking up relevant radio, so you can look that on. So, uh, reading one. In the beginning of is, I think it's Jeremiah, uh, 20, chapter 28, uh, one through verses 1 through 17. In the beginning of the reign, uh, and that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In the beginning of the reign of Second Sedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azura from Gibeon, said to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I'll break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I'll restore to this place all the vessels of the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king, or the yoke of Babylon, of the king of Babylon. The prophet Jeremiah answered the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people assembled in the house of the Lord, and said, Amen. Thus may the Lord do. May he fulfill the things you have prophesied by bringing the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles back from Babylon to this place. But now listen to what I'm about to state in your hearing and the hearing of all the people from, on, from of old, the prophets who were before you and me prophesied war, woe, and pestilence against many lands and mighty kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies prophesy peace in, is recognized as truly sent by the Lord only when his prophetic prediction is fulfilled. Thereupon the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of, of the prophet 
Jeremiah and broke it and said in the presence of all the people, Thus says the Lord, even so within two years I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from off the neck of all the nations. At that the prophet Jeremiah went away. Sometime after the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go to tell Hananiah this. Thus says the Lord, by breaking a wooden yoke, he forged an iron yoke. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, a yoke of iron will place on the necks of all these nations serving Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. Even the beasts of the field I give him. To the prophet Hananiah, the prophet Jeremiah said, Hear this, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you have raised false confidence in, in this people. For this, says the Lord, I will dispatch you from the face of the earth. This very year you shall die, because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. That same year, in the seventh month, Hananiah the prophet died. Huh? Interesting. Cool. And then the, the Psalms, was it? The, here's a gospel. Matthew chapter 14, 22 through 36. Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and proceeded him to the other side of the sea. While he dismissed the crowds after doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. <clears throat> when it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened and be began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. After making the crossing, they came to the land of Genesaret. When the men of that place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought to him all those who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel on his cloak. And as many as touched it were healed. Wow. That's my life. <laughs> but sometimes I forget to pray to help, to help me. But I could imagine for so many other people. Take the boat in the water analogy or use your own analogy and insert your own life. That you need God and God will always come with you. But you you lose faith throughout the way. That's what I did. That's what I do sometimes. And we just have to take away our pride and just say, God help me. I need help. If not, we drown. And drowning can mean so many things. You know, into depression, into being a murderer, into just as simple things as being a mean person. I mean, many of those things where you just, you know, not physically die, but you just go away from God. So let's end it by saying, please help us, God. Uh, and there's another morning prayer that I want to say. I think I hear my son coming, so perfect timing. So let's do for divine guidance through the day. Lord God Almighty, you have brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us today by your mighty power that we may not fall into any sin, but that our, all our words may so proceed and all our thoughts and actions be so directed as to be always just in your sight. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Direct, we beg you, O Lord, our actions by your holy inspirations and carry them on by your, by your gracious assistance that every prayer and work for ours may begin always with you and through you be happily ended. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, hope you guys, cheers, hope you guys have a good day today. It's a Tuesday afternoon, the sun's out, it's beautiful, it's probably 
at about 80, 90 degrees right now. So it's beautiful. Enjoy your day. And let's have a great day. Have a good one. Talk to you again.